as I mentioned in my blog uh, last Friday, uh, when Nick at Blackwell came almost three years ago, um, we uh, renewed uh, a rather casual friendship because even though he's a, a Bryn Mawr person, uh, and I'm a Bryn Mawr person, uh, he is not of my, my generation, <laughs> long, long past. Um, and so we, uh, we knew many common, uh, common people, and we also uh, uh, had corresponded about uh, some work, uh, some research that I had done about Iron Age Salamis, and which he uh, and published in 1988, um, and uh, which he then had wrote an article in the end in 2010. And so when we met, I said, you should come back and re revisit this and we should talk about it. Because Cypriot archaeology, um, though you might have been attending the Cypriot seminars this past um, fall and winter, um, generally speaking, does not get much attention uh, here, and probably Iron Age even less. So uh, we, this is a chance to visit a very important period in the uh, socio-political development of the island. And um, I'm very pleased that we finally, before he left uh, from his uh, position as assistant director of the school for the last three years, he was able to give this lecture. Um, I've already let it out that he is a PhD from uh, Bryn Mawr College, an MA as well, and he did his underwork at Davidson College in North Carolina, and there uh, uh, he came under the spell of Cypriot archaeology um, and uh, has worked for, uh, for many years at Afanu, uh, <coughs> a long-running project there. But what really interests me is that um, uh, I thought of him as a Cypriot person, but uh, because of my uh, narrow way of thinking, but when I saw his article that came out in, uh, I read the paper, that came out um, uh, last year in the uh, AJA on the Lion Gate Relief, I realized that not only does he study uh, bronze um, uh, tools used in various ways, but he also understands how they were used and looks is able to identify the evidence so that if you have not read his Making the Lion Gate Relief at Mycenae, Tool Marks and Foreign, Foreign Influence, this is a, an excellent article about putting it all together, about something every time you visit Mycenae, you go look up and poop through and don't think again. After this, you will think very carefully. So that uh, Nick is uh, interested in did his uh, dissertation work on, on metallurgy and stoneworking. He uh, uh, has, has written a number of uh, uh, articles re relating to this uh, in the course of the, um, uh, his uh, career. He is uh, um, a person who um, is, I think, um, um, very interested in melding these various parts of the picture and trying to make something more of it than we have before. So that we all know about bronze bronze tools, et cetera, metal tools, various kinds, but I'm not sure that we understand them as well as Nick does and we look forward to his, his uh, further, uh, 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 further uh, uh, writing. He's also somebody, because he worked on uh, in Cyprus, he's also interested not just in Cyprus, Anatolia, the Levant, and the Aegean. And again, from my perspective, you can't really understand uh, the uh, early Iron Age, let alone the late Bronze Age in the Aegean, unless you know uh, things farther east. And so this is something that uh, Nick has done. Um, he um, is the first, was the first person, is the first person still, to be the assistant director of the American School, a position that was created. And um, we're, I, think it, I think it worked, didn't it? It worked. It worked uh, as, a, as a concept. The school needed a change of uh, orientation, and uh, he came across, and in doing so, he learned a great deal about uh, uh, how things work and, uh, in this country, and I've met a lot of you. And all of you here is in a, a testimony, I think, to his um, uh, welcoming ways. So um, you probably uh, have learned more about him than then I'm going to tell you at this point. And um, uh, we are looking forward to talking about his, 
this uh, mortuary behavior. And at the end, I'll, um, I'll see what I can say. The, the, we had planned that there'd be a, a response on my part, and we'll see how inspired I, I will be uh, uh, about this. And um, uh, not having read uh, on the topic until recently, uh, reread, shall we say, and read additionally, I'm not sure my, my great thoughts of uh, uh, 30, almost 30 years ago uh, stand the test of time, but uh, I'm certainly, I will I'll see where we have congruence and where we have a, opposition. So, sure. Nick, take that vote. Thanks so much, David, for that introduction, uh, for the invitation to speak to you all tonight. Uh, it's an honor to, to speak here, and you know, uh, to, to supplement the introduction, uh, I'll say that I got into this topic uh, in part because I uh, was working at an archaic through Roman period uh, rural sanctuary on Cyprus, uh, not too far away, uh, in the Republic of Cyprus, but um, in the Meso-Oreo Plain, and that uh, got me interested in Cyprus, and many of David's articles on this topic uh, really influenced me, and, and uh, <clears throat> I was inspired by that to, to pick up the topic. Um, so, as the, the introduction probably uh, indicated, that this was something I haven't really touched on recently, so some of the new ideas I'm presenting are very much of a work in progress, and um, I'm happy for discussion and feedback afterwards. All right. <clears throat> The so-called royal tombs of Salamis were one of the most important archaeological discoveries on Cyprus during the 20th century. Tonight we'll, I will focus on these burials while also considering the neighboring Chalarca Cemetery, the nearby proto-historic site of Inkami, and the epic and legendary connection to this eastern coastal area of Cyprus. This multi-pronged approach to early Iron Age Salamis will reveal notable shifts in mortuary behavior and some of the factors that influence such activity. On the map of Cyprus, uh, the sites of Salamis, Inkami, Kition, Amathus, Corion, and Polypaphos are noted and will be mentioned throughout this talk. Like most Iron Age city kingdoms on, Salam on Cyprus, Salamis possessed a foundation legend associated with the aftermath of the Trojan War. Several literary sources, including Ripides' Helen, Sophocles' Ajax, and Bosanius in the second century AD, indicate that Teucer's homecoming from Troy to the island of Salamis was not well received once his father, Telamon, learned of the death of Ajax, Teucer's half-brother. Teucer was subsequently banned from the island by his father, though sources differ on the exact region, uh, sorry, the exact reason. Legend has it that Teucer and his followers subsequently traveled to Cyprus. Isocrates, in his Evagoras um, work, recounts the foundation story. Quote, and Ajax was second to him, that is Achilles, in valor, and Teucer, who proved himself worthy of their kinship and inferior to none of the other heroes after he had helped uh, in the capture of Troy, went to Cyprus and founded Salamis, giving it the name of his former native land. And he left behind him, and left him, sorry, and he left behind him the family that now reigns. The date for the origin of the city kingdom foundation legends, such as this one, is unknown. <laughs> The stories may correspond to the establishment of new 11th century towns that were distinct from their neighboring late Bronze Age centers. This paper proposes that the Teucer story was devised in the 8th century BC when Salaminians constructed a number of elaborate built chamber tombs meant, in my opinion, to emulate the architecture of Bronze Age infamy. The foundation myth is thus an artifact of Salamis's attempt to connect its rulers with a heroic past and to explain the expansive ruins of one of the most, the more impressive centers in the late Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean. The Salaminian geometric and archaic mortuary data signal important shifts reflective of socio-political changes. This paper reviews these trends and contextualizes the unique set of built tombs at Salamis against other burial practices and tomb types on the island. An epic tradition is attested on early Iron Age Cyprus beyond the aforementioned foundation myths. 
most famous is the Kipriya, a lost poem other than 50 lines, uh, in the epic cycle that provided a prequel to the Trojan War. The author of the poem is attributed variously to the Cypriot Stasinus, son of, a son-in-law of Homer, or Hegesias of Salamis on Cyprus, or Homer himself. <coughs> Where Cypriot Salamis is mentioned, somewhat surprisingly, in one of the Homeric hymns, number 10 to Aphrodite, which reads, quote, of Kithra born in Cyprus, I will sing. She gives kindly gifts to men, smiles are ever on her lovely face, and lovely is the brightness that plays over it. Hail, goddess, queen of well-built Salamis, and sea-girt Cyprus, grant me a cheerful song. And now I will remember you also with another song. Two words stand out here, well-built and Salamis. The description is certainly fitting for the elaborate architecture of the royal tombs, as well as Enchemy. Yet the inclusion of Salamis in a hymn to Aphrodite is unexpected. No sanctuaries to the goddess are known from the site. It would have been more appropriate for the hymn to mention Paphos on the southwestern part of the island, where the renowned monumentalized sanctuary of Aphrodite at Kuklia Polypaphos existed from the 12th century BC. Martin West suggested that the Salamis reference in the Aphrodite hymn may have originated from the poem being performed at Salamis itself. The perceived epic connection with Cyprus is stated even more explicitly, although albeit much later, by Pausanias in Book 10. He writes, But the Cyprians, who also claim Homer as their own, say that Themisto, one of their native women, was the mother of Homer, and that Euclid foretold the birth of Homer in the following verses. And then in Seagirt Cyprus, there, was a mighty, there will be a mighty singer whom Themisto Lady fair shall bear in the fields, a man of renown, far from rich Salamis, leaving Cyprus tossed and, and wetted by the waves, the first and only poet to sing of the woes and spacious the woes of spacious Greece, forever shall he be deathless and ageless. And Pausanias then says, These things I have heard and I have read the oracles, but I express no private opinion about either the age or date of Homer. The Homeric epics were clearly popular in Cyprus, and the stories appear in the Cypriot in Cypriot art such as this late archaic and early classical painted stone sarcophagus, recently discovered at Platopos. With this literary tradition as a backdrop, as well as the, a newly minted Republic of Cyprus in the 1960s, the royal tombs of Salamis were excavated and interpreted. The burial goods recovered from the dromoi in the royal tombs were spectacular. Chariots, wagons, horse skeletons, and the protective decorative metal gear, some of which are shown here. Furniture, elaborate metal craters, and imported Levantine and Aegean ceramics. Many grave goods displayed Egyptian or Assyrian iconography, indicative of the accessibility to foreign luxury items by the early Salaminians. The aspect <coughs> of the burials, however, that fascinated both the public and scholarly communities were the purported Homeric links. Uh, the royal tombs were thought to exhibit strong similarities to the burial practices in Patroclus' burial in Iliad, Book 23. Seven features from that heroic funeral have been cited as representing, sorry, as resembling Salaminian burials. Horse sacrifice, vessels with honey or oil, human sacrifice, cremation, the use of a liquid to extinguish the funeral pyre, the placement of wrapped cremated bones within a container, at the construction of a tombless over the deceased. The inclusion of elaborate thrones, a footstool, and a bed, all coated with either uh, ivory or silver in Royal Tomb 79, also appear to echo the Homeric description of Penelope's <coughs> furniture in the Odyssey. Initial interpretations explain these similarities as a result of Salaminians deliberately copying the Homeric epics. This perspective influenced scholarship on the cemetery for decades, and any study of the mortuary data at Salamis must address these epic links, which I do at the conclusion of the paper. First, it is necessary, however, to review the relationship of Salaminian burial practices with nearby Inkami and other Cypriot city kingdoms. The Bronze Age site of Inkami is located two kilometers southwest of the Salamis cemeteries, and has been investigated since the late 19th century to varying degrees by, the Briti sorry, by British, Swedish, Cypriot, and French expeditions. 
Founded in the mid-17th century, the <coughs> shows signs, early signs of metalworking, and this craft characterizes the site throughout its lengthy history. At some point during the 13th century, or the late, the late Cypriot II C period, the town was reorganized with streets according to a grid system. At that time, use of ashlar masonry expanded rapidly across the site. Ashlar, mas ashlar masonry, in fact, becomes an island-wide phenomenon during the late Cypriot II C and III A periods at sites such as Kitian, Kitian Pathari, Halasaltin Teke, Kalovasos Iosimetrios, Alasa, uh, Paleo Taverna, Kuklia, Kalepafos, and Mirtu Degadis. While ashlar masonry is incorporated into a specific uh, sorry, into special civic buildings and religious structures at these sites, Inkami surpasses them in the quantity of preserved ashlar in orthostate blocks. Large multi-roomed buildings such as the Ashlar Building, Building 18, and the Orthostate Building exemplify the best cut masonry from Inkami. And I will just point out here that um, this is Building 18, this whole block here, and this is the Ashlar Building. Ashlar blocks, however, occur throughout the site, and their ubiquity stand out when compared to the other late Cypriot centers. Inkami gradually was abandoned during the 12th and 11th <coughs> centuries BC, rather than destroyed by a single event. After 1050 BC, no evidence existed for either habitation or other activities at the site until the geometric period. The ultimate cause of this abandonment is attributed to the Sultan of Inkami's harbor, Inhabitants consequently moved to an area along the coast by the end of the 11th century. Thus, the status of Inkami in the early Iron Age has been overlooked. How much architecture, if any, was visible in the early 8th century, roughly 250 years after the site had been abandoned? Excavations at Inkami. Excavations at Inkami by the Cypriot and British projects uh, recovered a group of Iron Age terracotta figurines and limestone statuettes in the northern and southeastern sections of the town. The Cypro geometric and Cypro archaic figurines mostly depict women and have been interpreted as votive objects uh, dedicated at a shrine within or on top of the Inkami rooms. These dedications correspond chronologically to the nearby Salamis tombs. The female figures resemble the typical Cypriot fertility goddess, who perhaps was considered Aphrodite at this point. The dedication of female figurines at Iron Age Inkami represents a notable shift from the well-known male divinities at the site during the 12th century BC, namely the bronze ingot god and horned god statuettes, which are shown here. Northeast of Inkami is a flat plain with two distinct cemeteries that are less than 500 meters apart. More than 50 years ago, Vasos Karyorgis in the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus excavated the so-called <coughs> Royal Necropolis and Chalarka Cemetery just west of Salamis's standing Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine remains. The earliest Salaminian remains date to the late 11th century BC and are attested by walls, simple domestic structures, a sanctuary, and a wealthy rock-cut chamber tomb near the Temple of Zeus. 10th and 9th century BC pithos burials have also been found at the site. Yet there's, a rel there's relatively scant evi evidence for early Salamis in regard to mortuary activity and the built environment until the creation of the royal necropolis, which was in use from the 8th through the early 6th century BC. <coughs> An extraordinary set of nine built chamber tombs form that burial ground. Although the word royal was associated with the cemetery from the beginning of the excavations, not all scholars have understood the, the tombs to be the final resting place of the kings. Of kings. <coughs> the Chalarka area has a hundred plus rock cut chamber tombs spanning the 7th through the 4th century BC. These graves are small, clustered, and not nearly as impressive as their nearby counterparts. Due to the opulence of the royal necropolis, the Chalarka Cemetery has largely been ignored and rarely incorporated into the analysis of the region's mortuary data. 
These cemeteries, however, must be interpreted side by side to comprehend the shifting socio-political environment at Salamis during the Cipro-Geometric III, Cipro-Archaic I, and early Cipro-Archaic II periods. Analysis of both cemeteries relies on tomb construction, orientation, and the material found within the dromoi, since every tomb chamber was disturbed and looted prior to systematic excavations. Numerous grave goods were found undisturbed in each of the royal dromoi, revealing Assyrian, Egyptian, Greek, and local grave goods and iconography. The design of the royal tombs emphasized the ability to showcase the, funeral, the funerary rituals. As David Rupp and other scholars have noted, the royal tombs offered perfect arenas for mortuary activity. This conclusion is supported by an excessively large dromos in comparison to a relatively small tomb chamber. The dromos was thus the focal point of ritual and deliberately incorporated into public view. <coughs> Unlike the confined spaces of uh, the rock-cut chamber tombs, a large audience could watch or participate in the funerary ceremonies of the dromos. The picture at the bottom left shows the excavation of tomb 50s. <coughs> Notice the number of people working within roughly half of the dromo space. Activities within these spaces include processions with chariots uh, and wagons, horse and human sacrifices, uh, cremations, and the deposition of wealthy uh, goods, including impressive metal vessels and furniture decorated with ivory and silver. About half of the royal tombs included a formalized paved platform at uh, the end of the drone must be before the stomium, uh, which I used to put the arrow here, uh, such as this one at tomb 79. The excavators called this platform a purple lion. The Salaminian mortuary evidence can be grouped into three phases. Phase one occurs in the eighth century when seven of the nine royal tombs were built, including tombs 50A, tomb one, tomb 79, tomb two, tomb 31, tomb 47, and tomb 50. Two sets of graves are discernible, which I refer to as the greater and lesser tomb types. The most conspicuous difference is the size and orientation of the tombs. Five are significantly larger, oriented roughly east-west, and include a purple lion. The other four tombs are smaller, oriented almost perpendicular to the larger tombs in an approximate north-south direction, and lack a paved display area. Variability also exists in the type of uh, quadrupeds sacrificed, that is horses versus donkeys, uh, the metal gear associated with the animals, figural scenes versus undecorated uh, examples, uh, some of which are shown here, and the type of vehicle left in the dromos, a uh, chariot or a wagon. There are no, there's no evidence that the Chalarka Cemetery existed at this time. With the transition into the 7th century, the royal tombs began to be reused and the Chalarka Cemetery was founded, thus marking the beginning of phase two. These shifts also correspond to Assyrian inscriptions that, that record a fluctuating number of Cypriot city kingdoms. First, the 707 BC Sargon II stele found at Kition documented seven Cypriot kingdoms that paid tribute to Sargon II. Contemporary Neo-Assyrian cuneiform inscriptions from Khorsabad indicate the same number. By the second quarter of the 7th century, the prism of Esarhaddon lists 10 Cypriot kingdoms that paid tribute to the Assyrians. The establishment of city kingdoms, as perceived by the Assyrians, thus coincides with the changing Salaminian mortuary behavior. Only two new royal graves are built in the 7th century. Uh, tomb 19 at the beginning of the century, and tomb 3 at the end of it. During this time frame, tombs 31, 79, 47, 19, 2, and 50 are all reused. After the, 11th, sorry, after the 8th century, rulers no longer needed to construct their tomb. Instead of promoting their power with new facilities, 7th century rulers associated themselves with their elite ancestors through tomb reuse. The only grave without a second burial is tomb 3, which was covered by an elaborately constructed tumulus. After the Cipro Archaic II early period, all burials in the royal necropolis, new tombs and existing ones alike, cease. The Chalarka graves were ignored in previous scholarship because the excavators deemed it as a densely packed burial ground for commoners. 
Yet the Chalorka Cemetery originated as a semi-elite burial ground with ten tombs during the 7th and early 6th centuries. The first burials in the necropolis date to the super archaic one middle with tombs 23 and 30. Uh, Chalorka tombs 7, 10, and 17 appear at the end of the super archaic one period, while tombs 24 and 105 are attributed to the super archaic one to two transition. And finally, tombs 83, 84, and 96 date to the early super archaic two era. The tombs, with small chambers and stepped dromoi, were carved into a hard limestone ridge, contrasting the clay like rock found elsewhere in the Salaminian plain. In comparison with the royal tombs, the Chalarka graves are unimpressive. While the Chalarka Cemetery is secondary to the royal necropolis, several features indicate that the Chalarka area was reserved for semi-elites, at least initially. Ceramic evidence from these first graves attests to the group's ability to access imported items, such as East Greek, Rhodian, and Attic pottery. Several architectural details within the Chalarka early tombs also suggest prominence. Uh, within the burial chamber of tomb 17, a couch with a pillow was carved along the north wall, while tomb 23's chamber had six rectangular rest, uh, recesses in the floor, presumably for a wooden couch. Tomb 83 had a unique barrel roof, and tomb 84 had a decorative crescent relief above the stomium. Tomb 105 was one of the largest in the Chalarka Cemetery, and it partially employed ashlar blocks in its chamber where a depiction of a boat was inscribed. Although the Chalarka drome, sorry, although the Chalarka dromos length is about one-third the average of the royal dromoi, several points of comparison exist between the early Chalarka tombs and the royal examples. The most noticeable affinity between the two cemeteries is tomb orientation. Most early Chalarka tombs have a northeast-southwest orientation, with the dromos on the northeast end and the tomb chamber on the southwest. This orientation replicates the layout of tombs 1, 3, 47, 50, and 79 in the Royal Cemetery. Chalarka tomb 7 is oriented in a northwest southeast direction with the dromos on the northwest end and the cha tomb chamber on the southeast, which recalls the, layouts, the layout of Royal tombs 2, 31, and 50A. Other resemblances between the cemeteries suggest deliberate invitation by upstart nobles to connect themselves with the Salaminian rulers. Because of their rock-cut nature, the Chalarka tombs rarely utilize ashlar masonry. The four sides of uh, tomb 105 chamber, already mentioned above, um, and a built stoning facade with a lintel and posts utilize ashlar blocks. It is an intentional echo of the masonry found in the royal tombs, with tomb two as a good example. Animal and human sacrifices, ceramics, and pyres are further characteristics with which the, the Chalarka burials mimic the royal tombs. The Chalarka dromoi are significantly narrower, shorter, and stepped in comparison to the royal versions, making it arduous to perform funerary sacrificial rituals. Still, quadruped sacrifices occur in the dromoi of tombs 10, 23, and 84. This Chalarka practice must have imitated the funerary procedures of the nearby, more celebrated, more celebrated burials. Other points of similarity between the two cemeteries include common imported Aegean ceramics, the application of tin to pottery surfaces, comparable iron tools, and evidence of pyres in the dromos, implying the possibility of cremation. Clearly, the Chalarka activity in the super archaic one to two periods was intricately tied to its neighboring impressive necropolis. Finally, in phase three, when the royal cemetery fell out of use, the Chalarka cemetery expanded and lost its regulated status. During the, during the super archaic two period, 39 new tombs were constructed, or about four times the number in the super archaic one period. Analysis of the royal tombs, particularly in the first phase in the 8th century, has been central to interpretations of social organization on early Iron Age Cyprus. Two basic and contradictory uh, models exist. First, a traditional Cypriot viewpoint incorporates a Hellenized narrative to purport socio-political continuity from the late Bronze Age until the 4th century BC. 
This argument downplays the significance of the cemetery for understanding social structure in the late Cipro geometric period. Contrary to this view is David Rupp's idea of state reformation, whereby the first kings of Salamis utilized the royal necropolis to promote and legitimize themselves in their seat of power. This interpretation of the mortuary data is thus critical to understanding the social structure at Salamis and the contested discussion of continuity on the island. Rupp suggests that the reemergence of a state system transpired at some point between the 9th century Phoenician appearance at Kition and the erection of the Sargon II stele at the end of the 8th century. Rupp attributes the wealth of, in the Salamis tombs to emerging elites who acquired goods through Phoenician trade and subsequently emphasized their social status at death when their position and power were nego negotiable. Rupp's understanding of the early Iron Age is not based solely on the Salamis tombs. Rather, he also takes into account settlement distributions, a diachronic study of the Cipro geometric mortuary data, the appearance of monumental tomb architecture, the spread of Cipro archaic rural sanctuaries, increased literacy, and the early Iron Age economy. Rupp's analysis of the royal tombs recognized the importance of funerary of the uh, sorry recognized the important funerary shift from the eighth to the seventh century. He understood that socio-political power was fluid and competitive at the start of the royal necropolis, yet more stable by the second half. My analysis of the mortuary patterns in these two cemeteries confirms this socio-political fluctuation. We are in agreement about the stabilization of power in the seventh century and the importance of promoting an ideological message in the eighth century. Rupp envisions the intended audience of the initial royal tombs as the Salaminian community, with the tombs legitimizing the first kings among uh, localized competing elites. My understanding of these burials differs slightly. The occurrence of two burial types within the royal necropolis and the absence of a contemporary and competing elite cemetery in the 8th century suggests, at least to me, that the elaborate royal tombs and their mortuary displays promoted a corporate identity rather than an individual one. I interpret the intended audience to be Salaminians as well as rival city kingdoms. The promotion of a particular region may be expected in the 8th century when territorial boundaries are not set. The city kingdom territories are presumably firm by the 7th century, ju judging by the S.R. Hodden inscription. This stabilization probably accounts for the shift in mortuary activity at Salamis. In the rest of this paper, I build upon my earlier arguments of inter-regional competition by examining an ideological link between the Salamis tombs and the Inca Maroons. Um, to appreciate fully, however, the built Salamis tombs and their place within the mortuary tradition on Cyprus, it is necessary to review the evidence for rock-cut chamber tombs uh, and built tombs on the island. This map shows the distribution of these tomb types on Iron Age Cyprus. The location of built tombs, marked by circles, uh, is primarily limited to the southern and eastern coast of the island. Sites circled in red, have built tombs that will be discussed here briefly. <clears throat> Burial traditions in the late Bronze Age were characterized by their diversity, um, though rock-cut chamber tombs are the most prevalent. This variability is apparent at Inkami, which included rock-cut chamber tombs, simple tholos tombs, ashlar built tombs, pit graves, infant burials and vessels, and shaft graves. Burials appear within the settlement, and this intra, intra, uh, intramural practice is constant throughout the Bronze Age. The ashlar tombs, such as those, those shown here, um, are incorporated into domestic complexes. Um, and just to point out, these two tombs here are represented by these red dots right in the middle of the rest of the town. Um, so they're incorporated into domestic complexes, suggesting that they belong to an elite household. A comparable phenomenon in terms of the design and quality of the tomb architecture and its placement within a, a residential building is found at Ugarit in Syria. By the 11th century, chamber tombs, especially those found in, south, in the southwestern part of the island, incorporated long, narrow dromos thought to have been introduced to the island by Aegean peoples. Iron Age burial grounds are extramural, entirely separate from the settlement now. 
the use of a long and narrow dromos contrasts the typical short dromoi of the late Cypriot versions. The long dromos is considered a Mycenaean type and is well represented in the cemeteries of Corian, Kaloriziki, Kastraki, Alas, and Polypapos, Skalas. The simplicity of the rock cut chamber tomb with a rounded chamber and short dromos, sometimes in the form of a shaft, and occasionally as a sloped entrance, ensured its existence from the late Bronze Age through the classical period. The focus of the tomb design is its chamber rather than entrance. The same can be said for the so-called composite tombs of Amethus in the Cyprogeometric period. The chambers of these tombs are shafts cut into the bedrock. Slabs cover the shaft, uh, providing a roof for the chamber. A sloping dromos gives access to the tomb via a well-built stomium. This tomb type at Amethus is otherwise unique on Cyprus, but it resembles a possible uh, precursor to the Salamis tombs, since it incorporates a rock-cut chamber tomb in aspects of a built tomb. The royal tombs are the first true built graves on Iron Age Cyprus, but they bear little similarity to the Incomi uh, built versions. The concept of the rock-cut tomb with long dromos is radically modified at Salamis. The tomb area was first prepared by digging into the bedrock to form a sunken area to build the tomb chamber. Rubble, ashlar masonry, and or megalithic stones were then used to construct the chamber in this cut out niche. The facade of the tomb was excessively wide and close to the ground surface. Although the Mycenaean type of dromos was known on the island since the 11th century, the Salamis dromos is revolutionary. Not only is it long, but it is also extremely broad and surprisingly shallow. Without an obvious prototype on Cyprus or elsewhere in the Aegean or Eastern Mediterranean, the tomb type must be seen as a local development. Only a handful of later examples of this tomb form have been recognized beyond Salamis. Two built chamber tombs are known from Petri uh, Petriki in the Karpos Peninsula. The tombs date to the Cypro Archaic II period, just after the Salamis royal necropolis fell out of use. Still, the emphasis on the Petriki tombs is the large dromos in relation to the smaller tomb chamber. Grave goods are lacking, other than a horse skeleton from the dromos of tomb two. Another Salamis type tomb is found at Corian, this, which is at the bottom. This built tomb chamber, dated to the end of the Cyprochaic II period, uh, or about the early 5th century BC, includes one of the largest dromoi on Cyprus, measuring 24 meters in length and six and a half meters in width. By comparison, the tomb chamber is extremely small, but its, fa but its facade incorporates la uh, limestone ashlar masonry. The Corian tomb was looted and grave goods are thus presently lacking. The fact that the Salamis type tombs are not prevalent after the 8th and 7th centuries highlights their unique localized character. Built chamber tombs in the geometric and archaic periods are prominent on eastern and southern Cyprus, but differ significantly from the Salamis royal tombs. The axial multi-chamber built tomb is attested uh, by the Cypro geometric three period and is well represented at, at, at both Amathus and Kition. The use of multiple chambers implies that the primary focus of the funerary ceremony occurred within the chamber, hidden from public view. Two examples from Amethyst exhibit variability in the dromos, which can be perpendicular to the, the tomb chamber, as well as in, in an axial alignment to it. <coughs> At Kitian, two archaic built tombs worth noting are the Phaneromini uh, and Evangelis tombs. The Phaneromini example utilizes a megalithic construction for its tomb chamber, like some of the royal tombs. And that is this part here, that's all one, one large block. Uh, still, the grave is quite different from the Salamis examples because of the dual chambers. The Evangelis grave incorporates ashlars um, within its two chambers. Its narrow step dromos bears no relation to the Salamis type. Another version of the archaic built tomb employs a single chamber, a display area before the stomion, and a steeped stepped dromos. Two examples are the Traconas tomb in the Karpos Peninsula and tomb 12 at Thomasos. Like the uh, Salaminian royal tombs that possess a propylium, 
these tombs emphasize the area just uh, before the stomion. This aspect uh, is highlighted by the masonry of the facades, the proto-aeolic capital within the Thomasos tomb, and the carved relief depicting padded dancers above the Traconius uh, stomium. This overview of rock-cut tombs and built graves contextualizes the uniqueness of the Salamis burial facilities. A detailed look at the architecture of several of the greater royal tombs highlights their distinctiveness. The differential size of the tomb chambers in comparison to the Jerome White has rightly been emphasized in scholarship. The chamber sizes for tombs 47, 50, and 79 vary from 7.7 .7 to 9.6 <coughs> square meters. In comparison, the associated Jerome White of these tombs are between 16.8 and 27.6 meters long and 12 and a half to 13.3 meters wide. While the length of the dromos varies amongst these tombs, the broader width is more or less standardized. The emphasis, this emphasis is also apparent in tomb 1, whose dromos is relatively short at 5.2 meters, uh, but has a wide facade and dromos of 9.5 meters that is comparable to the aforementioned tombs. While the dromos and the propylium are venues for displaying grave goods and performing uh, mortuary ritual, the truly innovative aspects of the tombs are the width of the dromoi, the correspondingly long tomb facades, and the relatively shallow nature of the dromoi. These elements are in stark contrast to rock-cut chamber tombs, sorry, rock-cut tombs, and other built tombs on Cyprus, regardless of time period. These defining characteristics thus emphasize the architectural elements. This creation of an impressive built environment was just as important as the physical space that was needed for the mortuary ceremonies. The impetus and inspiration for the unique architectural design of the Salaminian built tombs is the expansive Inkami rooms, roughly 17 hectares in size. Parts of the site must have been uh, conspicuous in the flat landscape during the Iron Age. The existence of geometric and archaic terracotta and limestone dedications at the site suggests such a scenario. Although the mud brick superstructures would have collapsed um, or have been in a serious state of dilapidation, the ashlar masonry at the site would have been visible, at least partially, during the early Iron Age. Since the site was abandoned and not built over, the town probably lay in ruins, covered by silt and disintegrated mud brick. Given the flat topography of the Mesoorio Plain, the town could not have been forgotten, even centuries after its abandonment. A ridge This is a, a, a ridge that goes along the eastern edge of the site, and you can see that here. Sorry, a ridge exists along the eastern side of the town, but it is not very high. Any erosion from that ridge had a minimal effect on the site on site formation processes in the early Iron Age um, that could have concealed the town. The impressive ashlar facade and propylium sides of the royal tombs uh, 47, 50, and 79. Uh, resemble the masonry at Inkami. The orthostates and horizontal slabs atop ashlar blocks at Salamis are characteristic of Inkami stonework. The massive ashlars from these tombs were very possibly obtained from ashlar buildings at Inkami. Horizontal slabs occur in tomb 47's entrance and tomb 79's facade, marked here uh, by arrows. Uh, and these also have parallels at Inkami. Three orthostate blocks in the northwestern corner of Tomb 47's Propylion facade provide the strongest link to Inkami. Tomb 47's preserved facade block measures 2.2 meters in width, 0.8 uh, meters thick, and 1.8 meters high, while the two blocks on the northern side of the Propylion are 1.4 meters wide, 0.8 meters thick, and 1.0 meters high. The ashlar orthostate dimensions from Inkami's, Inkami's building 18 are as large as 3 meters wide, 0.7 meters thick, and 1.4 meters high. These similar block sizes suggest that blocks at Salamis were de uh, definitely acquired from Inkami. However, even if the Salamis masonry was not taken from the Bronze Age center, the Salaminian ruler certainly intended to replicate the Bronze Age masonry. The flat plain of Salamis is hardly an ideal setting for a cemetery, but its juxtaposition between the Inkami and the habitation area of Salamis was deliberate. 
the simple topography of the settlement's plain, where the built tombs mimic the situation of Inkami. The origin of the built tombs at Salamis has perplexed scholars due to the, due to the limited parallels on Cyprus and beyond. Given the Assyrian goods in the graves, some scholars have argued that Assyrian despots were buried here, but the mortuary facilities at Salamis bear no resemblance to those in the Near <coughs> East. Phrygian connections have also been proposed, but this assertion primarily relies on the tumulus erected over tomb 3, dated just 600 BC. Aegean connections have also been sought on account of the Homeric links. The origin of the built tombs, however, stems from the Salamanian desire to replicate uh, the Ashland masonry of infamy, and it is this reason why such a broad facade was utilized. No mortuary structure on Cyprus had ever displayed such an elaborate and extensive architectural facade. Spectators of the funerals would not have recognized the built Salamis tombs as graves. The shallow nature of the dromos did not give the traditional feeling of descending into a tomb chamber. Rather, standing on the propylium, one would have felt surrounded by walls and an appropriate scale for a domestic or civic structure. While viewers uh, would have immediately made the connection to Inkami, they would have also thought about the monumental structures at Kition and Playpathos, um, whose sanctuaries were founded in the 12th century BC. In fact, the continuous use and modification of these older sites and structures may have been the driving force that led Salaminians to emphasize their own past in construction in constructing an ideologically charged mortuary landscape. My proposal that the masonry of the royal tomb so liberally imitated the Inkami ones um, has considered the funerary setting when the entire facade, propylium walls, and dromos sides were visible. What was the image, however, of the tombs after the funeral? This question of tomb visibility is difficult to answer. The massive tumulus above tomb 33, sorry, tomb 3, erected at the end of the 7th century, has led scholars to speculate that smaller tumuli also covered the other royal tombs. Yet no evidence for tumuli exist other than the mound over tomb 3, and another large mound <coughs> near Inkami, um, sorry, near Inkami on top of a massive built platform. The latter was the cenotaph of the last king of Salamis at the end of the 4th century BC. The late date of these tumuli thus cannot prove that similar mounds adorned the earlier Salamis cemeteries. <clears throat> One wonders how easily tombs could have been reused if a large mound concealed it. It is notable that tomb 3, under the tumulus, does not have a second burial. The fact that the royal tombs are, uh, other, are otherwise reused only once uh, indicates familiarity with the burial ground over several generations. Was this social memory enhanced by the partial visibility of the graves? There is little doubt that the dromos was filled with earth after each funeral. The preservation of the horse skeletons, vehicles, and the wealthy luxury items indicate as much. Yet, was it necessary for a mound to actually cover the tomb? What if the top of the tomb facade, propylion walls, and dromoi sides were discernible, similar to the image here of tomb 79 during its, during its excavation? Here you can see the sides of this purple line here. Perhaps the dromos area was filled with earth except for the uppermost masonry course, which acted as a boundary marker. Such a scenario during the 8th and 7th centuries, although not as dramatic, dramatic as a tumulus, would have projected a strong ideological message. Partially visible masonry in the plain would recall geometric and archaic inkami, meaning that the Salamis inkami connection was evident at the funeral as well as afterwards. Evidence for this notion is twofold. The upper facade course of three royal graves, uh, tombs 1, 2, and 50, have crowning blocks with incurved middle sections. Perhaps this decorative element of the masonry indicated that it was meant to be seen following the dromos' filling. A similar crowning course may have adorned the walls of tomb 79, since the height of the megalithic tomb chamber, which projected beyond the ground level when excavated, is higher than the preserved provolium walls. A hypothetical view of the appearance of such a partially filled tomb is also here. The interpretation of this image finds support in a series of ashlar enclosure walls in the Chalarka Cemetery. This aerial photograph illustrates the extensive use of ashlar masonry surrounding the rock-cut uh, tombs on the Cholarca surface. 
the enclosure, uh, the use of enclosure walls may have been necessary given the dense nature of the cemetery. Uh, the, st sorry. the stones clearly demarcate individual tombs, but they may have served another purpose as well. Scholars have speculated whether the ashlar courses are remnants of small mounds over the tombs, yet there is no evidence for a single mound over any of the Cholite graves. The masonry of, this enclo of the enclosure walls are not, uh, is not standardized. Blocks are of different sizes, but typically make up a single course of ashlar stones. The distribution of the enclosure walls raises interesting patterns. Uh, sorry, interesting patterns. In the early Cholarca Cemetery, five out of the ten tombs have an enclosure course on the surface. These are tombs 105, 83, 10, 17, and 84. This distribution reveals variability within the early cemetery, since not all tombs had enclosure walls. Those that do, however, gen are generally uh, the more impressive graves. Considering the degree to which the Chalarka tombs emulated the royal necropolis, it is fair to question if the enclosure walls are also a product of imitation. No trace of ashlar courses surround the royal tombs. Thus, if the Chalarka enclosures replicated those graves, the top course of the Procolion walls in Dromoy would have needed to be visible. This trickle, the trickle-down effect of Inkami's influence on the Salamis graves is thus apparent in the Chalarka cemetery. The Cholarca ashlar walls also reflect a degree of differentiation, given their limited use in the Ashlar, sorry, in the Cipro Archaic II period, when 11 of the 39 new tombs, which is on the right side of the slide, have enclosures, and they're shown here in yellow. The continuation of utilizing enclosure walls in the Cholarca cemetery during the 6th and 5th century probably reflects the cemetery's established tradition rather than an intentional link um, at that late time with the royal tombs. In conclusion, the data from both royal tombs and the Chalarka Cemetery indicate important socio-political shifts over the course of two centuries, roughly 800 to 600 BC. During the, eight, during the eighth century, an elite group emphasized mortuary rituals and ceremonies to, leg to legitimize their linkage with and likely descent from nearby Inkami, which remains known to the Salaminians. A notable shift in burial practices at Salamis occurs when the city kingdoms and their territories are formalized, at least judging from the Assyrian inscriptions at the end of the 8th and beginning of the 7th centuries. Once the city kingdoms were set at 10, the tombs in the royal necropolis were primarily reused and the Chalorca Cemetery was founded. The riddle of the identity of the individuals buried in the royal necropolis remains unresolved. Given the importance of the tombs, grave goes an ideological link, it seems likely that the 8th century built tombs were for the town's ruling authorities. Since two distinct positions are evident within the royal necropolis, a cemetery may reflect group promotion and legitimization instead of an individual in a single position. Are these the very first kings of Salamis or established rulers who devise a strategy to promote regional power, legitimacy, and ideology among rival city kingdoms? The mortuary evidence supports a strategy of le legitimization through linkage with the past. Rump is right to emphasize the importance of these burials for socio-political ramifications, but alternate options may exist in the conclusion that the tombs were constructed for the very first king of Salamis. The importance of the new burial facilities in the 8th century and the grand architecture of masonry imitating Inkami suggests that the Tusser legend came into existence at that time. If the architecture in the, of the royal tombs were meant to recall the old nearby rooms, there must have been a story to accompany it. The creation of the Tusa story may have easily coincided with the establishment of the royal necropolis. While Tusa was the founder of Salamis, it is unlikely that the Salaminians considered him responsible for moving the settlement from Inkami to the coast. Rather, it seems more likely that the Salaminians recognized the Inkami ruins as Tusa city. Inkami was thus part of Salamis. It was old Salamis, and it impacted how newer Salamis developed and expressed itself, particularly in the mortuary realm. Since Iron Age Salamis was Greek-speaking, the Tusser legend also linked the origin of the town and its descendants to the Aegean. The impressive masonry and overall size of Inkami must have been fitting for a Trojan war hero. This foundation legend differed from Kition, whose origin linked the king of Sidon a fitting story for the Phoenician-speaking settlement.
The Tuesday story, in conjunction with the infamy strategy, uh, served two purposes. The Tuesday story, in, uh, uh, sorry, it solidified Salamis's claim of legitimate control of the region by connecting the present with the physical remnants of the past. At the same time, the Greek foundation origin explained why Salamanians spoke Greek and thus differentiated themselves from the nearby inhabitants of Kithion. The strategy of the early uh, Salamanians may have coincided with the presence of itinerant bards on the island. The funerary experience at any burial in the royal necropolis was intended for public consumption and even participation. These were lively experiential events loaded with sensory uh, simulation. Seeing and smelling the blood of sacrifices and cremations uh, would have had a powerful effect on those present, cementing the performance into history and memory. Given the tantalizing textual tidbits hinting at epic and Homeric connections to Cyprus, it is possible that, dramatic, that the dramatic mortuary scenes at Salamis were incorporated into oral traditions as a model for uh, heroic burials. Indeed, the striking number of epic similarities with the Salamis tombs arises only when the entire corpus of royal tombs is considered, um, demonstrating that the Homeric resemblance was not an intentional imitation of oral poetry. Scholars now recognize that elite burials with horse sacrifices and cremations are attested elsewhere in the Aegean Iron Age, at sites such as Lepondi and Eleutherna. Examination of the archaeological data through the lens of Homer, however, has been dangerous, as it forced the interpretation of his Salaminians either intentionally imitating epic references or adopting Aegean burials, sorry, adopting Aegean burial practices. The mortuary evidence at from Salamis, Lepondi, and Eleutherna are all possibilities for contributing material to the epic tradition, especially before canonical versions were formalized. The Homeric epics probably had several chronological and geographical layers in its composition, and the Salamis funerary images may have contributed to it. In other words, Salamis is more likely to have influenced the oral tradition than to have reacted to it. The surprising inclusion of, the re of a reference to well-built Salamis in the short Homeric hymn to Aphrodite may be a remnant of this relationship. Thanks so much for listening.